I think it's uh, 929, but we'll start anyway. And uh, that gives me a chance to broach the subject that this is the last time for 929. Uh, next week, uh, please make a mental note. We go to 10 a.m., even though it's only September 1st, so it may kind of jump at you and surprise you. Uh, but next week, we go back to 10 o'clock uh, for our Sunday morning service. So this is the last of the summer schedule. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Marsha for the beautiful arrangement here in the, uh, in the chantel, and it's uh, in the sanctuary, and it's from uh, Marsha for grateful and blessed. So we appreciate that. And coffee, chat and coffee are offered by the Wilsons. And we want to say goodbye to Elizabeth. Uh, I think, was it Friday you're taking off for college? Um, and you know Elizabeth has been one of our Sunday school teachers forever and stuff. So we'll miss you. We'll be thinking about you and keeping you in our prayer. Uh, if anyone, oh no, she's gone. I won't mention the big wide stop and shop. Crop Hunger Walk is coming up on October 13th, but we already have the pamphlets, uh, so if you'd like to collect money for that, uh, we sure would love that. It's going to be in Sunderland. It begins at the Sunderland Congregational Church. You can either do a one-mile loop or a four-mile loop, and uh, all of that goes to help Church World Service in their, help, in their attempt to help others help themselves, which I think is a nice way to do it. And so if you'd like to be involved with that, please see myself or Amy. Bible study from the Massachusetts Bible Society. I've mentioned it a whole bunch of times. If you would like to join that group, it's going to be starting in mid-September. Uh, but to be a part of that, you've got to get the books. There are three volumes. You can do it on Amazon. It's called Exploring the Bible. I think the three books will cost maybe $40. So if you would like to become a part of the uh, Bible study group here from September through like May, uh, we'll see how far we get. I don't think we're going to make it through all three books. Uh, but there is reading involved and homework. But I don't want to scare you with that. I just want to prepare you that it's not like just coming in and sitting down. There is This is, um, this is a real... Uh, broad scope of the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the history of where the Bible came from. So if you have no idea at all, uh, except for maybe the five minutes that we read Bible here on Sundays, this would be a perfect chance for you to learn more about the Bible in general. So I really strongly recommend that if you're interested, you do have that Bible study group starting mid-September, but you need to get the books in advance. Um, also, I signed up for the Super Saturday on October 5th. I'll be out in Framingham. If anyone else would like to attend, I think the link to that may be, um, I'm not sure if I put it in the newsletter. If not, I will post it on our website. You can see all the different offerings that they have that take place at the Framingham High School. There's a lot of people come uh, from out the three conferences. And so if you'd like to attend that with me on October 5th, uh, please let me know. Also, next Monday on Labor Day, the Waitley Congregational Church is having their annual Labor Day chicken barbecue. And if you would like to attend, the phone number is in your bulletin on the back page uh, to call up and make your reservations for the Waitley Congregational Church's barbecue. Any other announcements from the congregation? Okay, seeing none, let's go to the prelude for this morning's worship, which is, To you, O Lord, will I sing. Praises. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm.
Thank you, Anthony. So whoever you are and wherever you may be on your own life's journey, you are welcome here at Hatfield Congregational Church. Yesterday I drove out to a Webster for a committee on ministry meeting for the new three conferences, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Uh, so the technical, the legal name of the new conference as of November 1st and 2nd at the annual meeting is going to be Southern New England Conference. And uh, I heard the uh, people from the uh, higher ups uh, talking about this new Southern New England Conference. The nickname for Southern New England is So New. And I kind of thought that was cool. So we are the So New Conference, Southern New England Conference. And also uh, last night, uh, Sharon and I, and this guy over here, Tim and his wife, Andrea, we headed off to Tanglewood to see John Williams and film night with the Boston Pop. Uh, it was beautiful, it was you know, nice food and everything. Uh, got home, got to bed at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so all of the, uh, you know, the pistons aren't firing exactly right. I think that's why he's, he's laughing over there, see? So we're going to see how this works out. But uh, 1 a.m. this morning, I went to bed. So anyway, we are here in God's presence, uh, filled with his energy. And I ask you to turn to our call to worship. Let us assemble in the sacred presence of Christ. Come together to share in Jesus' love, his peace, and his promise. The word of God shakes the foundations of the earth. He should expect to be changed by his message and power. Jesus entered our world to rescue us from cruelty and injustice. His life and message deliver us from earthly limitations. This is Christ's holy Sabbath, the time to lay aside narrow interests and reach beyond ourselves to the eternal of God. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us now come together in our unison prayer. We are known to you, gracious Lord, better than we even know ourselves. You have given us life and have renewed our spirits. You have carried us to the heights, and you have dwelled with us in life's depths. You are our hope and our trust. Touch us here and transform us. Make us brave enough to challenge the ways of the world so that your reign prevails. Gather with us to lift our aspirations and to inspire our confidence so that we can become co-workers with you in creating a better world for all people and all of your blessed creation. Amen. All right, I think all of us should know this hymn. This is a real fun one. Uh, it's Hallelujah, verses 1 through 3 from the blue hymnal, number 106. <laughs> Get in and get out without any problem. 
There was not one little inch of green on that outdoor lawn around the Tanglewood Shed. There were just so many people there and it was, everybody was feeling good with this music. We got out into the parking lot with all those people. You couldn't get out of the parking lot because it was just like a tailgate at, at you know, a Gillette Stadium or something. And all of a sudden, all of that goodwill turned mean, just like that. <laughs> uh, so when we share that gift of peace, when we come here and share it amongst ourselves, um, let us also remember to take it out into the world uh, where it's also needed. Let us share with one another the gift of peace. And so Jesus gets really mad at the leader of the synagogue 
because the synagogue leader got all bent out of shape over Jesus helping the woman who was bent over. So my airplane here that flew pretty well, if I bend my airplane, it's not gonna flip. Right? That's not. All right. So that's just like a rock. You just kind of. Exactly. So I just like throw it like a rock. Jesus can heal the person who is bent over. He can straighten that out. He can straighten her up, make her able to praise God. But when we get all bent out of shape and angry and mad, Jesus can't force us to change that. God is all powerful. God controls the sun. God controls the stars. God controls everything. But he can't force any of you to do anything against your will. So in that sense, you're stronger than God. So if you get bent out of shape, if you get angry about something, you get mad at somebody, you get mad at God, and your Jesus is able to straighten up a person with a miracle, he cannot unbend somebody who gets bent out of shape. That's up to each one of you to try to unbend and to be a good person again, to be a good Christian. And God told Jeremiah, no matter how young you are, you can always do something for God. So try not to get bent out of shape and try to, oh look, try to fly good, all right? Okay, guys, enjoy your last summer Sunday school, and then next week we'll get into real classes. Enjoy. Oh, you can have it. That's my gift to you. Oh, you don't want it? Oh, oh there. Oh, I got another one. <laughs> Which one of you? You against you. Yeah. All right. I'm going to talk to my father about this. <laughs>
and pure. Great is thy faithfulness, beautiful. So it's now time for our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. Um, as the young people uh, finish up their summer vacations and head back to school this week, uh, we offer our thanks that it was a safe summer. We offer our prayers for a, a healthy and, and happy and successful uh, new school year. And I know parents are also celebrating, so that's a celebration for parents that the kids are off. Prayers for Dan Jordan. Uh, up in Maine, suffering from terminal cancer, um, under hospice care at home, and is failing as would be with his terminal cancer. And so we pray for him and his family and his friends. Um, prayers for Paula Casey, still still doing rehab, and that's Casey, uh, that would be Kristen's mom. And so we keep her in our prayers. Prayers for Johnny Benson as well. Prayers for Ed McCarthy, who's in the middle of his treatments for his cancer. And also, I've got a kind of sad story I want to share with you. Um, offered prayers for both Shirley and Richard Strykars, uh, friends of mine. Um, Shirley, they both have had health problems with cancer and heart. And so uh, the husband, Richard, brought Shirley into Franklin Medical Center, which is up in Greenfield, for her heart problems. Uh, brought her in, I believe it was on a Friday. Next day, he's not feeling so well. He goes to Cooley Dickinson because he's also a patient at Mass General. So Cooley Dick and Mass General are tied in. So his wife is at Franklin, he is at Cooley Dick, He's, he goes in in the emergency room, you know the story, uh, he can't get up into a room, I think it was about 10 o'clock at night. He gets into his room at 10 o'clock at night, his, uh, his son shows up at his room after spending the day with his mother to give him the news that his mother had died. Um, so while he is in the hospital, his wife of 49 and a half years passed away at another hospital. Um, and I mean, these two were extremely close. I'm not sure how many days it was, maybe three days later, he has a serious heart, um, I don't know what they call it, uh, medical people, you can help me, but um, it, his heart stops, he has, and uh, so they have to put him on life support, and then a couple days, not even a couple days, I think maybe a day or so later, uh, his son has to make the decision, and he unhooks him from life support, and the husband dies. Um, so the two of them died within four or five days of each other, and uh, you know I've been doing pastoral stuff for some 30 some odd years. Tuesday is my first ever two caskets um, at Risley Funeral Home for the husband and the wife, and this literally is a case of him dying of a broken heart. Uh, so if there's any rainbow to it, that is that beautiful message that he simply did not want to live. Uh, without his wife. So prayers for uh, Shirley and Richard who passed away and also uh, their son, Richard. Also prayers continue for a friend of mine, uh, Doug Bilecki, and another friend, Mark Lawrence. We continue to pray for Charlie Kellogg. Prayers for Glenn and Denise Wagner. Prayers for Muriel Kiovovich. Prayers for Lynn Omasta. And are there any other joys or celebrations, concerns, anything you'd like to share with us, the people of God? Go ahead, that's it. Okay. Seeing nothing, then let's just turn inward um, and whisper our prayers to Jesus. Sovereign Lord, whose will is broader than our best traditions and intentions and whose mercy runs deeper than our finest sympathies, speak your word to set us free from attitudes that cripple, habits that are harmful, and temperaments that would divide us. Bring us closer together. Help us to value and respect each other in what we do. Help us to see the good in each other and also all around us. May our time shared in prayer help us to better hear your voice hear your word and give us the conviction to act bravely in the name of our Christian faith. And now let us also join together in saying the prayer that Jesus himself shared with all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us down into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our gifts speak where we personally cannot go. They witness to people that we may never meet. 
They praise God who has provided for us. In appreciation for all of the blessings that we have received, we are now asked to give to Christ and also to His church so that we may serve the spiritual needs of this community and also the material needs of people both near and far. May we be as generous as our faith calls us to be and as our situation in life allows.
and really make an Anthony work with it. I'll teach you to go on vacation. <laughs> I thought I would be doing a lot worse than this. <laughs> is this a power button? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like... No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Is it on? No. no. <laughs> oh, oh these this? kids. These kids. <laughs> there you go. Need any other okay. anything technical? No. no. <laughs> This seems to be a common problem, by the way. <laughs> Surely I'm not the only one. Today's scripture reading comes from Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put up his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This ends the reading. And today's gospel is taken from Luke chapter 13 verses 10 through 17. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands upon her, immediately she stood up straight and began to praise God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days in which ought to be done these kind of things. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And not, not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When Jesus said this, all of his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. So I belong to the Masons, and I serve as the chaplain of my Masonic Lodge, and all of the officers have to wear, have to wear a tuxedo to meetings, and tuxedos mean bow ties. I have never, ever learned how to actually tie a bow tie, so instead, Sharon found online and ordered me one of these cheesy clip bow ties. The only problem with the cheesy clip bow tie is this little <coughs> hook He's got to get around, or no, this little clasp has to get around this little hook. And so when you put it around, and it doesn't work so much with all this on, but I'm looking in a mirror, and you know everything in a mirror is reversed. So I got to get this little thing on this little clasp looking in a mirror, and no matter how hard I try to get, look, it's so easy to do when you're looking at it, but in a mirror, if I tell my hand to go forward to, like this, it goes the other way. I'm sitting there in front of the mirror for the longest time trying to get this on, and I, I look like I'm this woman crippled. I can't do it. I'm, I'm, my hands are going every which way, and I should be smart enough to know that the mirror image is a reverse image, so I should be smart enough to be able to tell my hand if I want to go forward, imagine that I'm going backwards or vice versa, but I simply have the hardest time. I'm standing there for so long just trying to put this cheesy tuxedo bow tie on. And so the reason I share that with you is that my eyes do not recognize me. It's easy for me. If, I was, if somebody else at the lodge had to have some help putting on their bow tie, I could go over to them and put on their clip bow tie in a second. But I can't 
recognize me. I can see it in somebody else. I can't recognize me. So with that said, let's go back to this morning's gospel that I just read. The story of Jesus healing the crippled woman, but on the Sabbath day. Jesus is leading the synagogue. So he is being respected according to this biblical tradition. He is being offered as teacher to these people. But then this woman comes in and Jesus cures and immediately the synagogue leader stands up and says, you can come here because there must be something going on because this is somebody who would be normally opposed to Jesus. Come here and be healed on six days. So Jesus is recognized as a healer. Come here for six days, but don't you dare get healed on the Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to God. It is a day of holy rest. Now, the leader of the synagogue, He's not just making that rule up. That's one of those laws that comes down from God to Moses on Mount Sinai. And obviously, that's going to be extremely important to a man who's the leader of the synagogue. For him, there is no way that Jesus is healing with God's power if he disregards God's Sabbath. Again, this is not a man-made rule. This is something coming from on high. It's coming from God, he's saying. And that this... This idea that the law comes down from God and remains no matter what, it makes Jesus frustrated and Jesus angry. He yells out in the synagogue at the leader of the synagogue and all the others who are supporting him, and he says, you hypocrites. Now, hypocrites in Greek, that's a word for actor. It's a word for pretender. These are people who are pretending and acting to be people of faith, says Jesus. You hypocrites. You look like you're a person of faith, but deep down inside, you're only acting. In the Bible, Jesus' anger is raised repeatedly by people who use religion, who use religious law, who use religious tradition, and they think that they can use that to stymie the compassion of God. They use it to stymie their own compassion. There's an amazing passage in Mark's Gospel. A leper is actually hesitant to approach Jesus for healing. And the reason he's hesitant to come near Jesus is Jesus is recognized as this man of God. Like we just heard in the synagogue story, people come here for six days if you need to be healed. So Jesus is recognized as the man of God who has the power to heal. But the leper, he kind of stands back because the leper is considered ritually unclean. That means that he is kind of shunned by God. Lepers are not allowed to come into the community of God's people. Lepers can't come into a place of worship. Lepers could not come into a synagogue. And so they were shunned by God, therefore the people of God also were shunning the lepers. And so this person who was suffering so terribly, you've all seen pictures of what leprosy looks like. He's suffering so terribly. He's afraid to approach Jesus because he's not sure if Jesus is going to reprimand him. How dare you ask me such a thing? You are, you are despised by God. You are unclean in the eyes of God. I will have nothing to do with you. So he's afraid. And when Jesus sees that, the Bible says... In the words of the Bible, as an alternate reading, you can see it in the footnote at the bottom of the page, but it's a valid reading. It says that when Jesus sees the leper hesitant to approach him, it says that Jesus was moved with anger. He gets upset. How in the world can religion be used to push somebody so much in need away from the compassion of God, away from the compassion of God's people? And the same thing is being repeated in today's gospel of that crippled woman who comes into the synagogue, the place of where God is worshipped. Now, Jesus doesn't get into a theological debate in the synagogue. He doesn't bother with that. Rather, he asks the people sitting there a question. Jesus asks the question of the congregation. No, just don't obey. Think. Oh, that's kind of dangerous. Asking religious people not just to obey, but to think. As soon as you start to ask religious people to think instead of obey, then people who stand up here behind pulpits, we're not as much in control anymore. If you don't just obey what the guy up here says, and you start thinking about what you're hearing from God, well, that gets kind of dangerous, and that's kind of scary. And there's a lot of churches that say you better obey, or else you know, you're know you not going to be in a place that's too cool for too long. So thinking and faith... They're kind of scary. And that gets a lot of people scared. It gets a lot of churches scared. And it complicates religion. It's not black and white. It becomes really very colorful if you start to think in your religious faith. But thinking in faith never scared Jesus. And if it never scared Jesus, 
There's no reason why he should scare us either. Basically, Jesus asked the people who are worshiping around him that if they themselves are compassionate to their farm animals, why would they then think that God is not compassionate to us, his children? If we can be compassionate and take our farm animals to get something to drink on the Sabbath, why would we think that God would be upset if I heal this woman who's been crippled for 18 years and bring her back to health? And that question makes perfect sense and can be answered easily unless you're constrained by knowing the answer even before the question is asked. The person, the synagogue leader, who is really obeying the law, he already knows what the answer is before any question is asked. That ticks off Jesus. The synagogue leader had to oppose Jesus even though Jesus made common sense, never mind religious theological sense. Compassion had to be rejected in order to keep the rule. And just like the case of the man with the leprosy, Jesus is infuriated by this idea that the rule itself is holy. And this is when Jesus yells, you hypocrites, you actors, you pretenders. Jesus is warning us that the rules are not the religion, and the rules are definitely not a replacement for God. Jesus had to bring God in person into the world in a living, breathing body to tell us the startling revelation that the rules are not the religion, that God is the religion. And when God comes into the world in Jesus, the perfect revelation of God in Jesus, all of a sudden we find a God of absolute compassion. In the first epistle to John, he says quite simply, God is love. That's what the, you know, the experience of Jesus made those first believers feel, compassion, and God is love. An unnamed, anonymous, ordinary woman enters into the synagogue. Nobody special. Shouldn't have deserved any attention. Everybody else ignores her. Jesus stops teaching the congregation, goes over to this bent-over, crippled woman, lays his hands upon her, and after 18 years, she's able to stand up straight. The pain is gone. She asked for nothing. Jesus is the one who takes the initiative. And when he touches her, God just lifts her up, and she praises God with great joy. And that is that idea of she can be straightened up but the synagogue leader is bent out of shape. He's angry because he healed on the Sabbath day. Jesus can heal the woman. He cannot heal anyone who is angry at God because we're not following the rules. So God is a God of compassion, not rules. God is a God of love, not commandments. But for as clearly as we can see Jesus' compassion, the example of others from a long, long time ago, 2,000 years ago, can we see it closer to our world today? Can we see it anywhere around us today? It would be extremely easy for me to help someone else at the lodge put their you know, cheesy little bow tie on, but I can't seem to do it for myself because I can't see me in the mirror. I can't recognize me. Can the same thing happen with Jesus' teachings? Can we see it in a synagogue halfway around the world from two millennia ago, but maybe not in our lives today? Jesus' example seems pretty clear. His anger is consistent throughout the Gospels when people try to use God to justify a lack of compassion. When we look at some of the things that Christians and churches proclaim and some of the things that Christians and churches do and Christians don't do today, right around us, in our world today, in a certain sense when we look at ourselves, do we see this as clearly as when we look at people in the ancient synagogue or do we only see their story and can't really place it over our story. We have a little problem when Jesus yells hypocrite at someone else, but would we see it in the same way if he yelled at Christians and churches today, if he called us hypocrites because we're actors and pretenders who really have a hard time with God's compassion and love? Is there a lack of compassion in some of the things that we do and preach as Christians in churches? Do we turn religious rules into religious idols so they become excuses for acting harshly and unsympathetically, especially to the outcast, to the voiceless, and to the different? So maybe the story of Jesus in the synagogue could remind us to weigh our actions in our words with the rules that we all know and then the compassion and the love of God that Jesus brings into our world so beautifully. Maybe today's story can help us to step back and look at where 
we are from Jesus' perspective, instead of just looking in the mirror and trying to get that class that just won't work, maybe we can step back and look at it from Jesus' perspective and see how much this world needs that compassion and love of Christ and of Christian. So may Jesus help us to see ourselves more clearly as we should be in the example of Jesus and help us to live his compassion more bravely and consistently. And for this we pray in his name. Amen. So, with that said, let us now let us now sing together the prayer in the hymn, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Read hymnal number 353. I'm going to do it a little differently today. This may or may not come through the speakers, but we're going to find out. This is called a mountain dulcimer. Uh, nobody really knows where it came from, but uh, the South prides uh, on it being the only true American instrument. Came out of, uh, like I said, the Appalachian Mountains. It has ties to uh, Scandinavia, which I guess in the you know process of emigrating way way back when the 1700s. I guess they stopped by Virginia and Kentucky and they brought an instrument that looked something like this. Uh, but it's a really nice sound. And I just got a new one, so I wanted to play it for you. <laughs>
Uh, so if you know anybody that is unchurched and maybe thinking about joining somewhere, especially as the new school year begins, the Sunday school programming, etc., um, invite them to come next Sunday, see what church is all about, and uh, talk to us. And if they're interested, um, you know, they can come and join um, on the following Sunday, the 8th. And also, I once had a teacher who said, shepherds don't make sheep, sheep make sheep. And so, sheep of the flock, that's all of us. We've got to go out and spread the word. Uh, one voice goes a few people. All of our voices can fill up Hatfield. Uh, so share that invitation. Uh, sheep make sheep. So, new member Sunday is in two weeks. Let us now turn to our benediction response. Jesus promises to remain with us always. He will guide us if we will follow. With our faith in him, we will not be misled. His presence frees us to be better selves and uplift our spirits. Jesus transforms us and we can do more than we ever had imagined. The Word of God empowers us to speak and act without fear, without hesitation. Jesus sends us out to people who need our help. We will not be afraid to speak of Jesus' uncompromising love. We will dare to act with compassion as our faith expects. So let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord courageously.